Hosanna, blessed be the rock, oh blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, for he is worthy to be praised. Magnify the Lord with me, for he is worthy to be Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. And glory, glory to his name, he lives and reigns for of my salvation Hosanna blessed be the rock blessed be the rock of my salvation Jehovah Jireh is his name for he provideth all my needs Jehovah Jireh is his name Provideth all my needs. Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Will I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider fell into the sea. Will I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider fell into the sea. Hosanna. Oh, Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. And I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He called me out of sin and set me free. And I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He called me out of sin and set me free. And Hosanna, blessed be rock and blessed be the rock of my salvation Hosanna blessed be the rock blessed be the rock of my
when we have exhausted our store of endurance when our strength has failed ere the day is half done when we Try. 
shepherd's point of view. Things look different on the mountain from the shepherd's point of view. Standing high above the trials that he brought you safe. us. Jesus, we're so thankful, Father, to be here once again, to recognize, Lord, your provision in our lives and how wonderful you are and merciful, how gracious you are to us. God, it's been our privilege to sing your praises, to lift your name on high. God, now as we come to feast on your word, I pray that you would come to us, Lord, that you yourself would break the bread of life. As we surrender ourselves to your hand and give you preeminence, may you come and speak to us, Lord. Lord, speak to us comfort and peace. Lord, be our portion in this hour. We love you. We ask your blessings over all that we say and do. May you take full control and have your liberty here amongst us, we pray. 
In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. It's certainly good to be here with you today. Let's take our Bibles while we're standing. And I just want to take a second and welcome all the visitors. I know we got quite a few visiting today, and we want to say welcome to you, and God bless you. We appreciate having you here with us. Also, I want to say I appreciated the specials. It was Sister Ruth, she's here with her family, uh, visiting from Ontario, so we appreciate her. She's here with her husband and her two young children, and then and my kids, I was surprised. They didn't discuss that with me, they just did it, amen, and I praise God. I'm so thankful the song was such a, a testimony of what we heard Wednesday night, amen. and I thank God for that he's our shepherd, amen. 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 Let's turn to the book of John, uh, yeah, John chapter 10. And I just had a couple announcements. We want to remember Brother Emmanuel Sabas and his family. They traveled over to Pittsburgh this weekend. He's ministering for Brother John Kadima there. And so he's doing well. We text this morning with each other. And uh, then I want to let you know also next Sunday, Brother Kyle and his family will be traveling over there to preach for Brother John as well. And so Brother John's starting to have brothers through. The church is getting established. And I think all of the ministering brothers here are going to wind up over there in the next month or so. So that'll be fun. It'll be fun to go over there and see the work. And so pray for uh, Brother Emmanuel as he travels back and Brother Kyle and his family as they go next weekend. Also, I want to let you know that this coming Sunday, a week from today, Brother Burley Williams will be with us. So he'll be preaching for us then. So it'll be good to have him back, uh, the minister, once again. Amen. Let's take a look now at this scripture in John chapter 10, and let's read from verse 27. John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you have your seats. I'd like to preach this morning on a subject called our security. And we find Jesus says that we are his sheep and he is our shepherd. And he, he says, he tells us that no man shall pluck us out of his hand. That we are in his hand and nobody can pluck us out of his hand. And then he says, my father, which, is, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man can pluck them out of, no, no man can pluck them out of my father's hand. Then he says, I and my father are one. So I think we're very secure in the hand of God. And so I want to talk about our, our security because the world is so uncertain and un- insecure that I want to talk about where our security comes from. And... In the message, the trumpet gives an uncertain sound. The prophet said the national life is uncertain. Well, the world is uncertain. We're just living in a place to where the whole world is having a nervous prostration look like, shaking all. Every nation, everybody, one is afraid of the other. And if I don't know if you heard the news or not, but last night, Iran launched an attack against Israel. They sent a bunch of uh, drones and missiles or whatever, and and, uh, most of them were intercepted. And And there's just a feeling all over the world as you never know what's going to happen next. Everything is tense and and there's there's war in Europe and Eastern Europe and there's war in the Middle East and and there's tension all over the place. But praise God, we're in the palm of his hand. I'd rather be secure in the palm of his hand than secure in some place on this earth. And so, so I thank God for that. Brother Branham, he says in the message, the uncertain sound from 61, he says, your jobs, you ain't got no security in your jobs. I don't know how true this is, but I've been told that there's more people out of work right now than there was during the time of President Hoover's depression because there's more people. What's the matter? It's just a place where there's no certainty in these things. You're not certain of your job. Somebody can take your place in the morning. Politics. Let's just talk a while tonight. This is Saturday night. Politics crooked. Both sides, just so crooked as crooked can be. It proved it in this last election when the FBI exposed that they had machines that every time you voted for Mr. Nixon, they had vote for, Mr. for Kennedy at the same time, and they proved it. And what did they do about it? Nothing. Now, I'm not Democrat nor Republican, neither one. I'm a Christian. I agree with that statement, amen. 
The one pot can't call the, uh, the, the pot can't call the, uh, Call the kettle black or greasy. One's just as black as the other one, just as dirty as the other one. But what's the matter? It's because there's no security in those things. It's played out. A little further down, he says, don't care how much money you can make or how many buildings you can build or how much president you could come of any company. It's falling, crumbling. The thoughts in my mind now of that third angel's message uh, that would be Brother Brenham's ministry, the third angel flying through heaven, the third angel's message that went forth, Martin Luther, John Wesley, and the next angel. What did the last angel's message say when he crossed the three angels? Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and become the habitation of every unclean spirit. That's exa- exactly where it's at. We have no security in our nation. It's uncertain everywhere, uncertainty. There's uncertainty in your job, uncertainty in politics, uncertainty in Democrat Party, uncertainty in Republican Party, uncertainty in all parties. And in the church, it's also uncertainty. How can we have about 900 different organizations and every one of them different one to the other and fussing with one another? How can a poor laity know what to do? How can the people know where to stand? Praise God. I think he's telling us that there's no uncertainty. There's no certainty anywhere. It's all uncertainty everywhere. And this was 1961 when he made these statements. So if we could just fast forward, amen, 60, whatever, 63 years now, it's more uncertain than it's ever been. The world is perilous. The conditions are, 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 we're seeing extreme everywhere, extreme in weather, extreme in politics, nation against nation, the pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places, all the signs that we told we would see, they're all present. But we should be more secure than we've ever been. When the world gets more insecure and there's more uh, 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 insecurity all around, our security should be growing, amen, because our God, amen, he's come on the scene in this last day and peeled back the great mystery of his word and opened his book so that we can see he has a plan, he's always had a plan, and everything's worked according to his plan, and nothing's out of plan, and he's got everything under control. And we should find ourselves, by the grace of God, in the palm of his hand. Amen. And then we have nothing to fear. Praise God. Jesus makes this statement in Luke 21. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So men's hearts are failing for fear. They're running to drugs and entertainment, and and if they don't go to illegal drugs, they're going to legal drugs through psychiatrists and all just to cope with the way the world is. They fry their brains with entertainment and video games and and YouTube videos, and they're trying to keep themselves completely distracted because it's the only place to find any peace is distraction from the world because there's no certainty in the world. It's it's gone into chaos. And when we want to look at insecurity, we have to go back to the beginning. So let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And if I speak from our human experience, not from our born again experience, but from our human experience, I could say that we are all insecure. Every human being is born insecure and lives a life of insecurity. Amen, because he lost his security at the fall. And so he's born in sin, he comes into the world, he's shaped in iniquity, he comes through the world speaking lies, he's alienated from the things of God. And, and his mind is darkened to the things of God. And so how can there be any security? So we talk about insecure people, but in reality, all human beings are insecure. In Genesis chapter 2, let's look at verse 8. It said, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So we know God, by the power of the spoken word, He created and and formed everything on the earth, and what he was doing was reforming the earth after destruction, after a chaos, and he was putting it in perfect order, and when he got everything right, amen, he had an Eden there, which was which was his pleasure, and then he he, he made a garden eastward in Eden, 
and there he placed the man whom he had formed. And this word garden means an enclosure, an enclosed garden. So what did God do? God had the man in perfect security. This is when man was secure. Right here is when he was secure. He was secure in everything God made. Everything was in harmony. Nothing was out of the kilter. Nothing died. No, no animal ate another animal. There was, everything was in perfect harmony and unity and everything. The earth was secure. And God's son and his wife were secure. Why? Because garden means an enclosure. So where did God put him? God put him in security. He was in perfect security. But we know that, that man left. He left the word of God. And by leaving the word of God, he was sent out of the garden. And when he was sent out of the garden, he left his place of security and he, be he became insecure. And let's look at Genesis 3 now. Genesis 3, verse 6. This is the temptation in the fall. It says in verse 6, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Right here it begins. Because all of a sudden they're insecure about themselves. They had been naked for how long? I don't know how many years, how much time had went on, but they were in a place of security and innocency. The Brother Bram said they were under a veil of innocency and they weren't, they weren't insecure about anything. They weren't insecure about food. They weren't insecure about shelter. They weren't insecure about safety and security. They weren't insecure about themselves in any way. But the moment they fall, all of a sudden insecurity comes and now they have to cover themselves. And Brother Bram tells us they formed their own religion. What were they trying to do? They were trying to cover their sin but they did it by their own mechanism to cover their sin. But even their covering for their sin didn't bring security. Amen, it was a false security. Because you realize, you know, they, they, they had to make a covering. Now their eyes were open, they recognized they were naked, and we know the nature of the sin, how that their eyes were open. And so they made themselves aprons because aprons were an attempt to cover the sin. Amen, but, but, but no matter how much they make believe that everything was all right and everything was covered, as soon as the voice of God came walking in the garden, amen, they were really insecure. So insecure, this, this, everything begins in Genesis. Amen, you start by leaving the word, amen, leaving perfect security. You take your own decision and insecurity sits in. When insecurity sits in, then you try to find security in something you can do and a man-made security, and they attach that man-made security to them and no doubt made believe that everything was all right. But in the presence of God, amen, the insecurity that was buried in their heart could not be hid. Everything starts in Genesis. That is what we're still living with today. He goes on in verse 9, and the Lord God, I'm sorry, in verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. This is the first time they've ever been insecure with their relationship with God. There was a perfect security in their environment, a perfect security in themselves, and a perfect security in their relationship with God. But now at the fall, they were insecure in their environment, they were insecure with themselves, and they were insecure with their relationship with God. And tell me what every human being is still dealing with. The same thing. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Adam, said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Those are absolutely tragic words. He had lost his security. Insecurity had set in. And now the plague in humanity had begun. We come into this world and we are insecure. Some of us suffer with different insecurities and more severe than others in certain areas, but, but we come insecure. And as we grow older, it becomes more and more evident how insecure we are because as we get older, we try everything under the sun to bring security. 
And it all brings a false sense of security. There's only one place to find security, and that's in the palm of his hand. It's the only place that we'll ever find a place for our heart to come to rest is in the palm of his hand. Nothing else will work. When I looked at this uh, uh, term, insecure, insecure, I just went to the... um, Uh, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary Online and just got the definition. So we'll begin to look at the definition and they break it into five different types. First is a deficiency in assurance beset by fear and anxiety. Insecurity can be summed up by a deficiency in assurance. And you're not assured of something. Part B to this is not highly stable or well-adjusted. So you can be insecure in school. You're not highly stable or well-adjusted. You can be insecure in anything new. Number two, not confident or sure. It's uncertain. Number three, not adequately guarded or sustained, like unsafe. Not adequately guarded or sustained. Not firmly fastened or fixed, like shaky. Something's unstable. And number five, unable to reliably afford or access what is needed to meet one's basic needs. So like food security that the UN keeps talking about. Unable to afford or access what is needed to meet one's basic needs. These are all different types of insecurity. These are different ways of being insecure. I should say it that way. And so we find that we are all plagued with this in the human realm. But I don't want my spiritual life to be plagued by this. There has to be a security that will do away with the insecurity. And Christ is our security. When I began to meditate on this, I realized that that this is a plague amongst human beings, so we can't anyone escape it. You can say, well, that person's insecure, and that person's insecure, and that person, yeah, and so are you. So, I mean, so what? Maybe somebody's is more obvious than yours, but you're insecure too. I guarantee it. Amen. The only place that we can find our security is in Christ because he is our security. We won't find it anywhere else. Uh, We won't find it in accounts. And it's amazing how this world makes us insecure. The news makes us insecure. So if you have a news feed, one of the objectives of news is to make you insecure because then it, it brings to your attention the danger that's in the world. There's either danger by car accident, there's danger by natural disaster, there's danger from other human beings, there's danger from wars, there's danger in the environment. There, there, the, the news is constantly telling you you're in danger. So the news breeds insecurity. But the gospel is the good news, amen? And that good news brings you security, that you're safe from all of these things. And so we're we're surrounded by insecurity. And what the news does and and what the government does and what everybody does is tell you you're, you're insecure. And then what they do is they bring a false sense of security. You're insecure because when you get older, you won't be able to work. So we have social security. You have a 401k plan, we have this and that, but really it's a false sense of security because there's no guarantee that it'll be there when you get there to need it, amen? And even if it is there, who's, who's to say it's enough? And maybe you will never make it there, or when you make it there, it may not be there, or when you make it there, it may not be enough, or... Or when you get there, it may be enough money to sustain your life, but will it save your children? Will it solve your problems? Will it take care? No. There's no security anywhere. All these are human measures to find some way of bringing peace to a heart that's troubled. We try through laws and through regulations and through all of these things. They're trying to bring us security. Amen. It's amazing how much, how much the, the, the world spends on defense spending. I think it's so funny, too, defense spending. America spends billions on defense spending. When was the last time America had to defend its territory? That's not defense spending. They're the military arm of the Vatican. They're going out trying to fight all the Vatican's wars. It's not defense spending. We have nobody attacking the United States. (laughs) 
It brings a false sense of security. Even the terminology brings a false sense of security. We try to secure ourselves with tanks and missiles and ballistic missiles, and that's no security. Unless the Lord keeps a house, they labor in vain. Unless the Lord keeps a, build a city, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord keeps a house, they labor in vain that watch. So there's no security. All these things are false measures of security trying to calm an anxious heart, and it it is never going to work. That's why the world becomes more neurotic all the time. And I I think about how we pass on insecurity to one another in the simplest of ways. I was was just meditating because it's so easy to do. You think if you have, if you take a parent, you have a mother or father who's afraid of water, they're going, to pat, they're going to do their best to pass that insecurity on to their child. They're terrified of water, and every time that toddler starts running towards the water, they scream, they overreact, they run, they scoop them up, they yell, no, 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 don't you go near that. And, and, and it may have been just a small amount of water, no apparent danger, no real risk. The reaction was an overreaction. And all of a sudden, this little child, it begins to realize that water's bad, water's dangerous, water is something mom and dad don't like. And then as they get older, you tell them it's dangerous and you could drown. And then when they get a little older, you tell them all the stories of all the children who have drowned. And you think you're keeping them safe. You're not keeping them safe. What you're doing is building an insecurity. And actually, it's dangerous because you won't let them experience water in a safe way so they can build up, uh, uh, they can overcome a fear and build up an ability to navigate through the water and not be terrified and be able to swim so that if they ever do happen to fall in the water, all those stories of drowning are in their mind and the terror of mom. And they start thrashing around. They can't swim. They overreact. They drown. It was your insecurity you put on your child and you created a dangerous situation. That's an easy, that's, that's an easy one that, to look at, but we do that with religion. We do that with salvation. We do that all the time. We take our own insecurity and in religion and we put it on our kids, amen, because we don't really have any peace, so we'll clamp down on them because we can't overcome sin. So all of a sudden we take all kinds of, uh, of legalistic restrictions on our kids because there's nothing in me that has a power to overcome sin. There certainly can't be anything in you. And I put my insecurity religiously on my kids. And now they're afraid of everything in the world and God has no power to help anybody overcome any temptation or lust or... It's a human insecurity, but by the grace of God, God is going to help us overcome that in this generation because he's provided everything we need and the fullness of the word brought back the fullness of the spirit, which brought the power to live the word. Amen. Praise God. So we can overreact. We can become too strict. And it's all based on fear and insecurity and try to build a false security with a system of religion or a set of strict rules. And it, it's not going to work any better than the missile defense system is going to keep the bomb from Russia from falling in America. Because the prophet already told us it's going to fall. doesn't matter how much they spend on defense spending. You take, a, you take a mother or a father who hates peas, detests peas. You know you get a little baby food jar of peas and somebody brings that jar over and the first thing they say is, oh, she won't like that. How do you know she won't like that? So you crack it open and you take a little bit out and you put it, and as you're doing it, you're making a yucky face. It's your distaste, not that child's. And you make your face and what do you think that baby's going to do? And then maybe the baby likes it. You put it in the mouth, but you know they can't work their tongue yet. And they're they're licking it, but their tongue pushes it back out. Oh, they don't like it. I knew she didn't like it. It's funny, but it's not funny when we do it with religion. It's not funny when we do it with other things in life. You know what we need as parents? We know what we need as ministers. You know what we need as church leaders? You know what we need as elders? We need security. 
We need security that comes from the word of God so that we don't keep passing religious security down and creating more insecurities by building a false sense of security that will never work, amen. Amen. We need the genuine, we need the real, we need to know that we're secure. We need to be as secure as Israel was when God was the watchman on the wall. Not because they had walled cities, not because they had huge armies, not because they had great fortifications. They were, just, they were just slaves that were marching through a wilderness, amen, but they had a chief captain. They had somebody that was watching over them. That's the security that we need. Amen, I was thinking, uh, 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 I was meditating actually this morning. I remember there was a time when I was an 18-year-old boy and I got a, I got a, uh, I was working at, a, at a, a grocery store. I was in Cincinnati working at a grocery store as a student in school and college. And I was working as, a, uh, as a, a produce attendant and I was stacking the shelves and I don't know what I was doing, probably rotating produce. And I, somebody came up to me from the front office and said, Chad, you got a call, it's, it's urgent. And I went to the phone and it was my brother. And he told me that my dad had just passed away. And, and instantly, I mean, you can't imagine what it was like going from moving produce around to getting a phone call from your brother. He's weeping on the other end. And I tell you that to tell you this. For years, I was terrified every time I got a phone call. It did something to me that when I got an urgent call or somebody says, hey, somebody's trying to get a hold of you, they need you to call back right now. Whenever there was that scenario, something in me, my heart would start beating fast I would get sweaty, I'd start getting nervous in my stomach, and there was nothing wrong, there was nothing to be afraid of, but because I had that tragic experience in my life, now anything that was similar to that would cause a reaction in me. I was afraid to answer the phone, sometimes I'd overreact and run as fast as I could, or, or, but by the grace of God, he worked that out of me, and I'm thankful. But you realize how easy it is for these things to come into our life, amen? And what we need is we need God to heal our hearts, amen? Because we can't live life in fear and terror because we're in the palm of his hand. Amen. Nothing's going to happen. I used to, I, after that happened, I would actually, after I got married and after I had children, I would actually envision what that call would be like coming from my, for somebody calling about my spouse or one of my children. And I would terrorize myself because it was an old wound, an old uh, trauma in my life. But, but praise God, I have found my security in the word Amen. to overcome that. So there are things that happen to us that we can't control. We can't just say, stop being insecure. I'll try. I mean, I'll do what I can. I'll, I'll stop trying to be afraid of heights or afraid of water or afraid of a phone. I'll try. But you know, no matter how much you try, you can't just stop feeling insecure. Because the only way to stop feeling insecure is to all of a sudden feel secure. So how in the world am I going to feel secure if I have no real security? I'm going to have to find security. But it's got to be real and genuine and everlasting. And, and it can't be, it can't be, uh, 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 it can't be a, a security that fails or is flawed or won't hold up. So we have to find that security in the word of God. And this is what heals our heart. When we find in the word and in the scripture that God is faithful to his word and he's made precious promises to us, that word can heal our heart and bring us a security that can help us overcome trauma in life, overcome things that have happened in the past, overcome things that are still troubling us. You're not going to find it at a psychiatrist office. You're not going to find it by jumping into entertainment and you're not going to find it by pretending it's not there. You're going to only find it in the word of God. Amen. By the grace of God, his spirit will come and make that word live inside of us. And it'll bring a true genuine security to where I'm actually not at all afraid of a phone call. And those thoughts never enter my mind anymore because I know everything's under control. God knows what's going to happen. And I don't have to be afraid of what will happen because God has got a time and a purpose for everything. And if God allows something to happen, it's the very best thing that could happen. We got to come to that kind of reality. It's, that's got to be 
That can't just be something we say because you can say that all you want and then you'll go around acting completely insecure, wringing your hands, being nervous and upset. So it's just words coming out of a mouth. That doesn't, that doesn't bring security. When the revelation strikes the heart, that's what brings security. Amen. So we do this to one another all the time. We do this to our children. The government does it to us. If we've had a bad church experience and people in the church have heard us or our ministers heard us, then all of a sudden we don't want to trust church people and we don't want to trust the church and we don't want to trust ministers. And, and God can heal all of that because God has to have a real genuine church somewhere. He has to have a real fivefold ministry. There's got to be, if God set it up and told us to submit ourselves to there's got to be a real one somewhere. And notice I didn't say a perfect one because there's not a perfect one anywhere, but there's got to be a real one somewhere, a real body of believers that want to serve God and genuinely love each other, a real ministry that wants to serve God's people and minister the pure word of God. It has to be alive somewhere because it's the word of God. So some of those things we have to get over. We have to look at the word and say, God, I need some security from your word because I've been made insecure by past hurts of ministers, past hurts from churches. And the problem is we'll pass that right down to our children because we'll be reluctant to enter into fellowship. We'll be reluctant to receive from a minister. And then we'll tell our children things like, be careful. Be careful of what? Just be careful. Don't get too tied into the church. Don't, don't be too trusting. And all of a sudden, what kind of seeds have we sown? You think God wants us not to trust in his word? Not to trust that he can provide? We can't pass these things on to one another. If there's anything I want to pass on, let me pass on faith in the Word of God, confidence in Jesus Christ to keep me, uh, an absolute faith that God will keep His Word. No matter how many people fail, God will keep His Word. If it didn't work 15 times, it'll work the next time because God can't fail. Brother Bam said, if I called a prayer line and every person in that prayer line died the next day, uh, died that night, the next day I'd have a prayer line pray for people because the Word can't fail. It's not confidence in man, it's confidence in God. So there's so many things that create insecurity. There's only one that I know of that creates security, and that's Christ. I want to go through some scriptures as we look at this, because I, I think we can find that everything that we have to be insecure about, he is provided in the word. And I'm going to go through scriptures fast. That's why I did a PowerPoint today, so I can go scripture to scripture. So if you just keep your notepad handy, if you want these scriptures, just jot them down. Amen, because we're going to keep moving fast. So I first want to look at what it means to be secure. So we looked at insecure. So what is secure? This is the same thing out of Merriam-Webster's dictionary online. Free from danger. Does Christ make us free from danger? Affording safety, and they use the example, a secure hideaway. Is Christ a secure hideaway? Trustworthy and dependable. Is Christ trustworthy and dependable? Free from risk of loss. Everything that I commit unto him, will I lose it? No. Two, easy in mind being confident, having confidence. Can I be confident in him? Amen. Assured in opinion, having no doubt. Amen. Can he take away all my doubts? Amen. Can he give me his faith so that I have confidence in him? Assured, that means a secure victory. I'm assured of overcoming. I'm assured of being delivered. I'm assured of being rescued. And four, able to re reliably afford or access what is needed to meet one's basic needs. Can he meet all my needs? Can he afford it or access it? Yes. So we find that our security is found in him. Let's look at insecure again. A deficiency in assurance 
beset by fear and anxiety. A deficient, this is one that's amazing to me, a deficiency in assurance. So if, if my insecurity comes from a deficiency in assurance, I have to find a place to get assurance. And that if I get assurance, it'll overcome a deficiency in assurance. So if I can find assurance, then I'll be secure. Not because I do some mental exercise. Not because I say something out of my mouth. Not because I distracted myself with other things or I created a false uh, protection from it. None of that will work because it can't get rid of the insecurity in your heart. Your bank account can't take care of that. Your job can't take care of that. The government can't take care of that. And your spouse can't even take care of that. Your mother and father can't take care of that. Your minister, your pastor, your church can't take care of that. There's nothing that can take care of the insecurity in your heart. Everything else becomes something to put security in. That will fail. The only thing that won't fail is Jesus Christ. A deficiency in assurance not highly stable or well-adjusted. So this is where I want to start going through some scriptures because we want to find our security in the word. Hebrews 10, 21. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Where's my assurance? My assurance is faith. Where did I get faith? It was a gift from God. And I have assurance in faith. I don't have assurance in all these physical things, but I have assurance in faith that he who promised it cannot fail. 1 John 4, 17, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. So what will take care of the fear in my heart? The revelation that he first loved me. When I was unlovable, before I deserved his love, before I could do anything that would merit his love, he loved me first. And because he loved me first, he gave me the capacity to love him back. And that, amen, that will do away and dispel fear because fear is what brings insecurity. So what will bring security? The revelation that he loved me first. But what if I mess up? He loved you while you were messing up. He loved you in the midst of your messing up. He loved you before you knew that you could even do right, before you even attempted to do right. He loved you first. That's why you love him. And let that dispel the fear. Amen. And we could go on and on and on through the Bible, but I just grabbed just a couple scriptures for each one. Not confident or sure. Not being confident, this is another insecurity, another way we can be insecure, not having confidence or or not being sure. You know, this is a tragedy when it comes to the message. We go to a message church, we sit, we claim we believe, we worship, but if we're not actually confident that it's the truth, it's going to show up somewhere in our lives. It, uh, there's no way you can't fake this. You can't pretend it. There'll be enough circumstances in your life that that'll pop out. Amen. But we got to find by the grace of God, a confidence and an assurance that this message is the truth. And you can only receive that by divine revelation. God's got to plant it in your heart and reveal himself to you because this message is Christ. And he must reveal himself to you that this is me. And if we can't find that, there's going to be a problem somewhere down the road. In Jeremiah 31, 3, it says, The Lord hath appeared of old and said unto me, and old unto me, saying, Yea, have I loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Why did God draw you? Because he, he loved you with an everlasting love. Not a love that fades, not one that he can change his mind, but he loved you with an everlasting love. And because he loved you with an everlasting love, he drew you. How did you get here? How did you hear the message? How, who, who drew you? Did you bring yourself or did God bring you? If he drew you, then he loves you with an everlasting love. Isaiah 30, 15, for thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved, and quietness and confidence shall be your strength. What am I... What am I supposed, where's my strength come from? In rest, in quietness, in confidence. 
My strength doesn't come from action. My strength comes from rest and confidence in God. Why? Because it's never my strength. My strength is never enough. The strength that I have in myself is never enough to accomplish anything, to save myself, to deliver myself, to overcome anything. That's not mine, so I'm relying on his. And how do I know where his strength is? It rests in his word. Amen. So I have to just rest, amen, and wait with confidence on him to perform his word. And that's my strength. Ephesians 3.11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. He has given us the faith that gives us boldness and confidence. It, it doesn't come, it, it doesn't come just by working it up. Amen. Boldness and confidence doesn't come by working it up. It comes by confidence, by faith of him. That's his faith he's given to us. It's not, not just working up our faith, but it's actually a gift of his faith. And that's where our confidence comes from. That's what gives us boldness and access with confidence. 1 John 5, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Now, there's no reason to have no confidence and not be sure. Why? Because I'm not looking at myself. I'm looking at him. He's the one who purchased. He's purchased full, all redemption, all that was lost in redemption. He purchased it back by his own blood. I'm looking to his blood. I'm looking to him. I'm not looking to myself. I'm looking at his word, the promise he made me. And my confidence now is in resting in him to perform his word. If not, we strain and we try and we press and we get more tired and more frustrated and, and more discouraged and, and we start to, our faith starts to wane. Why? Because we were trying to use our efforts to do something and our efforts will always collapse. But our strength is in quiet confidence. Number three, not adequately guarded or sustained, being unsafe. This is another insecurity, not adequately guarded or sustained. We, we know how risky life is. And there's danger all around. But you're still in the palm of his hand. Remember, when that tornado was barreling towards your house, you're in the palm of his hand. When that car was barreling through the intersection, you're in the palm of his hand. There's nothing that can take away from the security you have in the palm of his hand. So not feeling adequately guarded or sustained. In Philippians, he says, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Here's the question. Has he begun a good work in you? If he's begun it, then it's guaranteed to the finish line. He doesn't finish what he started. If he started it, he'll finish it. There's no way that he can fail to finish what he started. Amen? If, if he didn't start it, then we, we should be nervous. But if he begun the work, he's going to finish it. What do we need to do? We need to quietly trust in him and have confidence in him who will finish his own work. Proverbs 8, 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is safe. The name of the Lord, we have his name because his name denotes his person, his presence, who he is, and he's given us his name this day. In fact, we bear his name, Mrs. Jesus Christ. We are in the strong tower of his presence, of his person. He's unfolded himself to us, and we are locked in that tower. Listen, this message is not tapes and books. This message wasn't somebody's idea. This message is Jesus Christ, the word, the living word that has been restored to us in this day, and it is a strong tower that we run into. I'm not not talking about a set of doctrines. I'm not talking about a, a one man's preaching. I'm talking about Christ the word that has made himself manifest in this end time. That's the message. If we talk about the message and you see a, a healing ministry and you see a prophetic ministry and you see books and tapes, you're not even seeing the message yet. You're seeing the mechanism God used to bring the message to us, but the message is Christ restored back to his church to come in union with his bride. 
That is the message. He is the message. The message is he is here to unite with you. And he is the word made flesh. And he is a strong tower that we run into. That's why this word can't fail in this generation. We're not insecure or unstable. I mean, if you look at me in my flesh, I am. But if you look at the inner man, you look at Christ in me, there's no instability. There's nothing unstable. There's nothing unsecure. It's all been secured from before the foundation of the world. You see how powerful this revelation is and how much we need the revelation of the hour because if not, we're going to be tossed about on, on, these, on these waves that are rolling all around us and we'll be tossed up and down and we'll have no real security. But our anchor will hold because our anchor is tied to the unmovable word of God. If we have a different idea every day, you know a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We need to come back to having confidence in what God's given us and keeping our confidence rested there. In Matthew 28, he says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. All power. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Who's with you? The one who had all power in heaven and earth given to him, and he's with you to the end of the world. Are you secure? Yes. I believe you're secure. Do you always feel secure? No. That's why we've been trained not to trust our feelings, but to, be, but to, but to have faith in the word of God. I got a feeling we're going to have to pass this test. And we're going to have to pass it again and again and again, where we stop relying on the way we feel about something and start looking at where our faith is in the word and put our confidence in him and put our confidence in the word and, and because we could get tossed all about emotionally, amen, we're emotional wrecks someday, amen, and we feel good and we feel bad and we feel like we have victory, we feel like we have defeat, but we got to stop moving with the feelings and stay fastened to the word because that's the only thing that's gonna overcome in this generation. You know, there's, there's, there's news coming so fast. There's been never been a generation that gets information as fast as we get information. And every tragedy that strikes anywhere can be, can be sent to you and you can be notified of it within minutes of the tragedy and they can pile up one after another. There's a flood somewhere, an earthquake somewhere, a war somewhere. Your grandma's sick and your great uncle just died. And you can get all that the same day. Listen, how in the world are we going to cope? No wonder the world's going crazy. They can't deal with this much negative information all the time. Oh, and by the way, interest rates are high. Houses are still expensive. And, the, and it looks like the economy could collapse any minute. We have to get to the place that says, that, that doesn't move me. That has nothing to do with it, amen. That all may happen, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or God's seed begging bread. I'm in the palm of his hand. There's no insecurity in their news. There's no, I, my security is not the financial system of America or the world. I, I, I'm not, my, 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 my existence is not based on the government. I exist because God wants me here to shine his light. And as long as he wants me here shining his light, nothing's going to take me off of this earth and take me out of my position. And the minute he's done with me and removes me, I'll be glad for the exit ramp to go to the sixth dimension. I can't lose. There's nothing that's going to hinder me. What do I have to feel insecure about? The creek's rising. The creek's rising. Let's move to higher ground. And if I can't get to higher ground, he's going to have to deliver me. And if he doesn't deliver me, he's taking me home. Where's the insecurity? Amen. The, this bride 
Amen. We may face more and more pressure as time goes on. I, I don't know, and I, and I really don't want to uh, uh, project bad omens, but there's a lot that the prophet told us, and it looks like things can get pretty tight and kind of squeezy and maybe pretty difficult. Amen. And we're going to have to stop trusting feelings and quit looking to anybody else for security. We got to get to the place where my husband is all that I need. He provides everything for me. I'm secure because he said I was secure. I rest because he told me to rest. Amen. He told me that he's watching over me. He's my shepherd. I'm in the palm of his hand. He's the strong tower. I mean, how many scriptures do we need to go through? But you know what happens? The very next time we get bad news, every one of those scriptures is out of our mind. And all we can think about is what kind of cancer was that they told me? Circa noma, comma, sama, something. And that's normal. That's human. You don't have to feel bad because you're trying to remember what the doctor told you. But just don't dwell on that too long before you come back to the scripture and say, but by his stripes, I'm healed. That God will never allow anything to happen that he hasn't approved of first. There's a purpose in all of this. And I, though I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. Why can't we just speak the scriptures and stop speaking medical science and stop talking about disasters and talking about all the negative things? And how are you doing? Doing horrible, this happened, that happened, the plant closed, and, 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 and I lost my job, and, and the bills are coming due, and all, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. That tends to be the way I talk, if you don't know. I preach to myself a lot. But why can't we say, praise God, the plant closed. I lost my job and I got bills due. I can't wait to see what he's going to do this time because he made a promise to me. I can't wait to share the testimony in the church. I can't wait to tell you what, what's going to happen. Amen. And it drags on and it drags on and you get beat down and you get wore out. But praise God. Amen. The testimony gets greater as time goes on. Lord, help that to be my perspective all the time. That's the right perspective. You say, well, sounds like you lost your mind. Praise God. Mine was defective anyways. I think I'll take the mind of Christ over mind any day. That's the one that's going to do me good, and that's the one that's going to get me out of here. Praise God. Now let's look at this fourth definition, not firmly fastened or fixed, shaky. Are we on shaky ground? Amen. Praise God. First Corinthians, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another build it thereon. But let every man take heed how he build it thereon for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. What foundation are you on? Is it in any way shaky? Is it any way unstable? If you're built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, which the true church is built on, then there's nothing shaky about your position. Amen. Praise God. Ephesians 2.19. Now, now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Are we on a good foundation? We are on a good foundation. The world is shaking. But remember I said the world is falling apart. Let her fall apart. It's going to fall apart. But one thing's not going to fall apart. God and his seed are not going to fall apart. The word is not going to fail. Matthew 16, 16, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it, it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What's the church built on? On the foundation. What foundation? The rock. The rock of what? The revelation of Jesus Christ is the rock that the church is built on. And it's unmovable, unshakable. Amen. It's not, te you, the church has never been teetering. It's always been secure in Christ. He is our security. Remember Jesus told the, the parable of the man who built his house on the rock and the man who built his house on the sand. 
And he likened the man who built his house on the rock. And see, the waves came, and the floods rose, and the waves beat vehemently, and the wind blew. And one house stood, and one house fell, because one was secure. One was insecure. The one that was insecure had no foundation. I mean, it was on the sand that moves and shifts. That's the ideas of man. The ideas of man move and shift. Feelings move and shift. If, you're, if your Christian experience is based on a feeling or a sensation you had alone, that's shifting sand. But it must be based on the Word of God. Our feelings, our emotions, they change. Our ideas, the ideas of groups of people, they change. But Christ never changes. God said, I am God and I change not. And he said, the one who built his house is the one who heard my word and did it. It's simple. The one who received my word and just surrendered to it and obeyed it, that's the one whose house is built on this rock. The one who had another idea or a better idea or a church system that had some other idea other than the obedience to the word, amen, that fell down in the time of storm. But in the time of the storm, the one that was fastened and attached to the word by obedience to the word, that one stood the test of time. I thank God he's restored his word. So that we're not guessing anymore, we're not hoping, but God sent a prophetic ministry to restore the word so that we know what he expects and what he wants and what we can surrender ourselves to so that we can be fastened to the rock. Now we look at this fifth one. Unable to reliably afford or access what is needed to meet one's basic needs. It's interesting. So they talk about food security all the time in the United States. There's people with food insecurity. They can't access. They can't get to the food. Uh, they can't purchase it. But when we look at it, for us, unable to reliably afford or access what is needed to meet one's basic needs. You know, we may come to this place before we're out of here. It's a possibility based off things that the prophet told us. And you know what? That little plastic card that you pull out of your wallet and use when you buy groceries, that may not work someday. And every government system may fail, and if it doesn't fail, it may fail us because we won't be part of the system. We're going to have to know where our substance comes from. We're going to have to know who's been providing it all along. Never was your job, it never was your account, it never was your car, it never was the government. That's never what provided it. Those are the mechanisms God's used to feed you and care for you. But that God's not limited to those mechanisms. When they go away, he has mother, mother mechanisms. When Elijah lost his mechanism, he sent ravens. When, when the brook dried up, he sent her to a widow woman. God has never been without resources. Amen. When Elijah was running away and there was no widow woman and there was no ravens, he just sent an angel to bake him some special cakes. Amen. When, when, when Elisha the prophet was in Dothan and he was surrounded, amen, by the armies of Syria and, and, and his servant wakes up and he's, and he's all nervous because we're surrounded by the Syrian army, Elisha wasn't worried at all. Amen. He had nothing to feel insecure about. Why should Elisha feel insecure? Amen. He could look out in the spirit and he could see surrounding the Syrian army was another army and it was angels and chariots of fire all upon the hillside. He had nothing to feel insecure about. Gehazi couldn't look into the spiritual realm so Gehazi could only see in the natural and in the natural it looked like he was at risk. It looked like he was in danger. It looked like he was insecure but the truth is he was never in danger. He was never insecure. He was never at risk. And that's what Elisha knew. And Brother Bram told us he comes to a meeting and he says there's angels lining the walls of this building. And the question is, can we look into the spiritual realm and recognize that the angel of the Lord encompasses about them that fear him? Amen. In the times of trouble, in the times of disaster, in the times of fear, amen, you can't stop your body from reacting to a situation. You can't stop the anxiety, the adrenaline dump. You can't stop that. That's just a natural reaction because you live in a natural body. But as soon as you get a hold of your senses, you have to say, wait a minute, flesh. 
I know you're scared and I know you're reacting, amen, but there's another power higher than whatever power we're facing, and that's the power of God. He's promised in his word and his word can't fail. So listen here, flesh. You who wants to run away and you who's scared and you want to scream, stop it. Sometimes we just have to know how to possess our vessel and not let our vessel possess us. We've got, we've got to learn how to rule and reign with Christ, so we've got to rule and reign this little bit of earth first before we rule in the millennium. And sometimes you've got to pull it back down and say, wait a minute, you're not running this show. You're not leading our decisions. I'm not following your lead. You little terrified, scaredy cat. Who are you talking to, the one in the mirror? You stop it right now. Because I put my trust in the Lord. And he shall deliver me. Amen. Why do you think we keep facing trials? And why do you think they keep getting more intense? And why? Because we're in training, friends. We're learning how to depend on him. We think, many times we think it's just a bunch of random bad things that happen to us. And you're a child of God. You're part of the economy of God, part of the kingdom of God. You're an attribute that was from his mind, a part of himself that he's put in the flesh to manifest the word. And something random just happened to you. Something bad, random, random and bad, and it just happened to you. No, see, the revelation brings us back to the truth. Revelation just wasn't so that we can know the Bible better than every other, every other denomination knows the Bible. It actually must produce something inside of us. It come to bring us faith so that we know that these things are true. We know it's true that I'm not in danger. Am, am I having a trial? Absolutely, but he promised that there would be trials. That's also part of the word. He promised that a man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of troubles. He told his disciples, the world will hate you. They will even kill some of you. He never, he never gave them a false understanding. He told them, you're going to be tried. You're going to be tested. There's going to be hard things that happen to you. Amen. Look at the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. Amen. Was God not on the scene? Was he not in control anymore? No, he was working his plan and that was part of the plan. But when bad things happen, as he told, when he, when he, we talked about on Wednesday, when he told Peter, or Paul, the apostle Paul, I mean, he had a horrible affliction, a messenger of the devil sent to buffet him. And he wanted it to go away. I think you would too. And when he saw God three times, the Lord says, basically, I'm not going to take it away. Because of the abundance of revelation, I need you to stay humble. But listen, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Don't worry about this ailment. You've got an ailment, it's gonna stay there. Don't worry about this family situation, it's gonna stay there. Don't worry about that. It may remain, it may go, it may remain, but no, whether it goes or remains, don't forget his grace is sufficient for you too. He'll give us the grace to pass through our trials. Why? Because they're part of him manifesting himself. It's part of him declaring himself upon the earth. Praise God. So unable to reliably afford or access what is needed. But my God shall supply all. Can you read that word? All. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Well, God promises to supply all my need. Just remember... All your need may not be a bigger house and a better job and a nicer car. That may not be your need, but he has promised to supply all your need. I mean, he's not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh, pride of life. That's not what he's here to do. Will he pour blessings on it? Yes. Will he give us an abundance? Yes. Will he give us more than we ask? How many can say that's absolutely the truth? He gives more than you ask. He showers blessings. He gives in abundance. He does, but he's not here to answer the prayer of lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. He promised to supply all of your need. Then as a loving father, many times he gives you in abundance. And for that, we say thank, thank you. But when he says no, can we say thank you? Because he's promised to supply all of our need. 
Philippians, he says, be careful for nothing. That word careful means anxious. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I love this. He says, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. So you ask God, you ask God to help, then you thank him for his help. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds. What does he promise to give you? Maybe not the want you ask for, but peace he will give you. The peace which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What does peace do? It takes away insecurity. Peace takes away insecurity, and he's promised to give us peace. John 16, 23, and in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Does God want to provide? He wants to provide. Does he want us to ask? He wants us to ask. Will we lack and be without? I'll ask you a question. Uh, uh, insecure, you can become insecure when you don't have the funds or the access to things that you need. Well, if I was looking at myself to provide everything I need, I should just start feeling insecure right now. But if I don't look at myself and I look at him to be the one that provides, he's the one who told us that, that don't, don't seek after garments, don't worry about raiment, don't worry about all these things the Gentiles seek after that, but consider the lily in neither toils nor spin, but Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Amen, look at the bird, not, not one of them falls to the ground that God doesn't know it and they have no, no material value. If God looks after a bird, what about you? He wants to provide, and I want his provision. I want his provision more than all of my wants. Because my wants may come out wrong. My wants may lead me astray. My wants may come from the wrong motivation. Amen. I want him to supply all my needs, and I want him to be the one who decides what I need. Will I ask? Yes, he told me to ask. I'll ask, and then I'll trust. I'll ask and trust him to give. Amen. It's like when your child asks for a popsicle and you give them a carrot. I remember we had little kids, you know, they were done eating. You know, you have vegetables there and you have some meat and you have all kinds of good things. And I'm not hungry. And then you let them know that we have chocolate cake. I want a piece. I thought you said you weren't hungry. One of them told us one day, well, I'm not hungry for this food. I'm hungry for that food. You said you weren't hungry, but you're hungry. I don't want to be like that with what God's provided me. I ask for something, and he gives me the best thing I need. We pray for comfort and peace, and he gives us trials and tribulations. Amen, because trials and tribulations are better than comfort or peace. Our comforts are just beyond the river. And when he gives me a carrot instead of a popsicle, I want to say, thank you, Lord. You provide all my needs. Praise be to God. Amen. What are we preaching about? Maturity. But it's such a simple subject, and we're failing every day. Amen. But Brother Chad, this is so simple. It's absolutely so simple, and it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, is to rein this flesh in to stop chasing security elsewhere and stay planted on the Word and the Word only and stop trying in my own measure and stop looking to someone else to save me and stay fastened to the Word and trust God for everything I need. I don't know about you, but I need this lesson. And need it again and again and again. Yes. Amen. Brother Bam, in the message, a true sign that's overlooked, he says, as I said a few Sundays ago, I thought somewhere along the road, it's not a fallout shelter, it's a fall in shelter where we fall into it headlong with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind into Christ, God's ark of safety. People are looking for fallout shelters. I'm looking for the fall-in shelter. 
I want to fall on that stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands. I want to run into that strong tower and be saved. Amen. I want to be found in Christ because how can you have any greater security than in Christ? Amen. And how can you have any greater security in your heart than Christ in you, the hope of glory? You in him and him in you. That's our security. Praise God. John 14, he says, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He's giving true peace, not the false peace, not what the world offers, but he gives us true peace. Amen. Amen. Oh, praise God. I think I went the wrong way. Okay. I want to go to one scripture. I don't have it in my my slides. But if you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Brother Brown makes a statement And I want to look at that statement that I want to read here from Ephesians chapter 1. And it comes from questions and answers in 1961. I don't even remember what the question was that was asked. But I just pulled this little excerpt out of it. And Brother Bram says, if you notice Paul in going down, he always had trouble with the Corinthian church. He never found them that way. He never said nothing about it to the Ephesian church. He could teach them eternal security There's nothing about eternal security in the Corinthian church. They were always babies trying. One's got a tongue. One's got a psalm. Isn't that right? And so now he begins to parallel the epistles to the Corinthians with the epistles to the Ephesians. And he shows how the Ephesians were more mature. And in their maturity, they weren't struggling about the gifts and they weren't arguing about ones of Apollos and ones of this and ones of that. And and, and they weren't weren't, uh, uh, misusing the gifts. And, but he shows in Ephesians or in Corinthians and he types it with the Pentecostal move. And he shows how they were just babies and they were just like, like all the steam was going out the whistle and none of it was getting into the wheels to move the train down the track. These are all things that he describes. And so because the Corinthian church was still uh, focused on emotional things and signs and, and, and wonders and, and they weren't getting to the deeper things of God, they were in this and they were arguing and they were fussing and he was dealing with them on this level, but he couldn't deal with them on the level he dealt with them in the Ephesians. The Ephesians he could take to a higher level. And Brother Bram ties that with our day with the Pentecostal movement. And, and he, he himself, amen, is trying to take the church back to Ephesians to the beginning. And Brother Bram said there will be an Ephesians again in Laodicea. So that means in the end, we're going to go back to what the church was intended to be from the very beginning. What Paul was setting in order when he was the apostle to the first age. And so when we come back to that, we want to come back and see what the Ephesians had that the Corinthians didn't have. The Corinthians had gifts, but no real security. Because with all their manifestation of gifts, they had infightings and they had insecurities and they had one there with his father's wife and they weren't dealing with, they had all kinds of other issues going on and turmoil, amen, that he didn't have to deal with with the Ephesians. The Ephesians he was taking to a higher order and that's where Brother Branham came at the end of the Pentecostal, uh, the Pentecostal revival and he was trying to take them back to what Paul taught and bring us to maturity. And here in Ephesians 1, 3, this is what Paul teaches. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. What is the deeper things? It's bringing an absolute security to the believer by revealing to them their origin. The Corinthians couldn't go there yet. They were too tied up in the other things. But the Ephesians, he was trying to take them to a greater revelation, a greater understanding. And he goes on to say, I I want to read that again, verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. 
having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. What does this have to do with your works? Nothing. He hath made us accepted in the beloved. If you've been accepted in the beloved, then you're secure. Why did he do that? Because he predestinated you to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. Why? Because he chose you before the foundation of the world in him. All of this goes back to God's desire, and that's where our security comes from. Amen. We live in a day where we've been returned back to what Paul taught, back to the true security, and that security goes all the way back to the mind of God before the foundation of the world, before anything was spoken to existence, before anything was created. Your security today is linked back to then. And you're just as secure today as you were as an attribute in his thought. This is what it means to the, you're going to be in Ephesians again in Laodicea. What does that mean? There's a church that's coming back to what Paul taught, coming back to the security of eternal security, not in a false way where I'm eternally secure and I can do whatever I want where the Baptist ruined it, but to the real genuine, genuine revelation of who you actually are, who you are in the depths of your soul and what God had planned for you from before the foundation of the world so that we don't get tossed about like children. So that we don't get moved by everything that happens, where we can keep our feet planted on the rock of Jesus Christ, the revelation of who he is in this generation, and not run and not move and not get scared and not look for salvation from anywhere else but from the Lord. That's what this revelation is to do to us, amen? It's not for puff up, it's not for knowledge, it's not for argument. It's to keep your feet planted on the word so that you don't move in every trial in your life because God knew this before the foundation of the world. He knew I would be here. He planted his seed within me. He sent the water of the word to bring this seed to life. I've been in the sunlight of this message growing into his image. What do I have to be afraid of and why do I have to run around scared? He's known this before the foundation the foundation of the world. That's what this revelation in the end time is supposed to do to us. Bring security. Not insecurity. Not, not you have to do this to be a believer and you have to do that to, to be in the message and you have to have this. That all breeds insecurity, but the word brings security that I am who I am by the grace of God and he's called me. He's drawn me. I'm in his hands. He knew me before the foundation of the world. He planted my feet upon a rock, the rock of this revelation and now I cannot be moved not because of what I've done but because of what he determined before the foundation of the world when he made me a accepted in the beloved. I don't have to perform things. I don't have to accomplish things. I don't have to manifest things. Amen. So many times that confuses people when we go to the works trying to, man, trying to prove we're a believer so that we can feel secure that we're a believer. Dress right, talk right, go the right places, don't go to the wrong places. But listen, that's a natural outcropping of being a believer. Those things cannot make you a believer. What that'll do is increase your insecurity. First thing we do is come to the security of Christ by the revelation of his predestinated plan for our life. And then stay planted there and let the fruit just come out. You mean I don't have to dress right? I don't have to, I don't, listen. You were a child of God before you knew how to dress. You were a child of God before you knew how to walk. You just weren't born again. You weren't awakened to it. You don't have to do any of those things. You mean I don't have to do any of these things? No, you don't. Brother Chad, what are you saying? I'm saying you don't have to. But if you're one of them, it's the natural outflow of being a child of God. It's what happens to the children of God. They have a life with Jesus Christ. They have a hidden life. They've been behind the veil. They have communion with Christ. Amen. They love him with all of their hearts. They are secure in him. He manifests himself through them. And there's signs and wonders and dreams and visions. Amen. There's words of knowledge. There's prayers that are answered. There's supernatural events in their life. All of that is an outcropping of being a believer, but none of that can make you a believer. 
What do we need first? I first need the revelation of who I am and I need the understanding of where I came from and why I'm here and how secure I am in the thoughts of God so that I can stay rooted and grounded in this word and lay in the presence of the Son and let him draw the fruit out of the seed. And what will we do? Dress right, talk right, go to the right places, have the right kind of family, uh, apologize when we're wrong, repent when we fail, come to church, submit to ministry, have manifestations of life. We'll have all of those things. Because that's the result. So Paul now, the apostle Paul now is telling the Ephesians, this really is bigger than you. This started before you came here. When, and before the foundation of the world, he already chose you in him. You've been predestinated to be, I'm striving for adoption. Listen, you were predestinated to be adopted. Not because you strived and climbed, I climbed that pyramid. Yeah, okay. When you hit the ground again, let's talk. <laughs> you're not climbing anything, he's drawing you by his own power because you're in the palm of his hand. He goes on here, read verse 6 again, to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. In him, his will, he purposed, he did, he accomplished. In him. Are you getting it? Amen. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. In whom also... In whom ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of your inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Question is, are you secure? I'll ask you the next question. Have you always been secure? but I didn't feel secure. Was God waiting for your feelings before he finished his plan? He formulated his plan before you could have feelings. So your feelings won't change his plan. Let's look at the token. He says, we're not to come together to talk about the message. We are come together to get in the message. And the message is Christ. He is the word. And he is a strong tower that the righteous run into and are safe. The message is Christ. He is the word. That's right. We're not to get into it, get beneath it. We are to get into it, get beneath it. Yes, sir. That's what we're supposed to do. He was not responsible for any person out from under the blood, not one. No matter who he was, he was not responsible. All had to take Uh, all had to take not only himself but his whole family. They're only safe when the token was displayed. We cannot feel safe until this token is displayed. That's right. You must come under this token, God's Holy Spirit, and it displays to you Jesus Christ because it comes and lives in you. What is that? That's his life. What is that? The seal that seals you to the day of redemption. Guarantee the earnest. Are you going to make it? Yes. Yes. How are you going to make it? Because he's deposited his life in here. I'm going to read through several scriptures. I found it very fruitful to read some of the things that David wrote. David, as you know, was a man on the run. He had done nothing wrong, but he was being chased. Now, if we could put it in perspective, David was being chased by the United States Army, and the president hated him. The president of the United States had a personal agenda against him, and he commissioned the elite of his forces and his armies to hunt him down and go after him, so the Navy SEALs are on your tail. Could you possibly feel insecure? 
Would you maybe struggle in your flesh? And not only that, but you've done nothing but serve the president and you've won victories for him and you've done all the right things and you never mistreated him. You always were right and he he loved you in the beginning and now he turned on you and he hates you and you've been betrayed and your name has been slandered and you're being hunted down. Do you think that you could possibly feel insecure? You're hiding in a cave and the Navy SEALs are coming. There's an Apache helicopter flying around looking for you. I mean, they've got night vision scopes and and all of these things and, and... What do you think you would feel? Oh, well. So we want to put in perspective where David was when he wrote some of these psalms. Psalm 56, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. I hope you never have an Apache helicopter hunting you down. But if you do, this is still the truth. The Navy SEALs are after you. If the Green Berets have been commissioned to come and find you, this is still the truth. Psalms 56, 11, in God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid of what man can do unto me. You know what creates a lot of our insecurity? Worried about other people. What will they say? What will they do? Will they try to take something from me? Will they say something about me? Will they accept me? Do they not accept me? Will they promote me or not promote me? Do they like me or not like me? And we get all kinds of insecurity about other people. But we're not supposed to be afraid of what other people can do or say or think. We put our confidence in God. Psalm 9 The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know the name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Psalms 125, they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion. I believe that. Which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even forever. So is he still round about his people like the mountains around Jerusalem? Absolutely. But I can't see him. Neither could Gehazi. And that didn't matter one not whether he could see him or not. They were there anyways. I don't feel like I'm Jerusalem and surrounded by the mountains of God. I don't feel that way. It doesn't matter what you feel. The word says it and it's got to be the truth. You are surrounded by the mountains of God. Psalms 118.8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. What would that be? The government, magistrates, leaders, just trust God. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Proverbs 14, 26, and the fear of the Lord is strong confidence and his children shall have a place of refuge. Psalms 127, 1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Psalms 121, 2, my help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. Well, praise God, who's your helper? My helper's the one that made heaven and earth. (laughs) Who do you have helping you? I've got the U.S. government. Well, I've got the one who made heaven and earth as my helper. The Social Security Administration's my helper. Well, my helper made the heaven and the earth. Who's your helper? I'll take my helper over your helper. Amen. Amen. In the latest in church age, Brother Bram says, Matthew 4, where Jesus is tempted of the devil, he overcame the personal temptations of Satan by the word and by the word only. In each of the three major trials that corresponded, that corresponded exactly to the temptation of the Garden of Eden, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, Jesus overcame by the word. Eve fell to the personal temptation of Satan by failing to use the word. So what was the fall when it really comes down to it? Jesus overcame by the word. Eve fell by failing to use the word. 
You know we're coming right back to the same spot in Eden? But remember said the bride will be tempted by this. She'll come face to face with the same temptation that he was faced with. What's that temptation going to be? It'll have something to do with either taking the word or not taking the word. Sticking with the word or taking some other thing. The word has to become everything to us. Our confidence, our deliverance, our security, our promise. It's got to be where we place our confidence. He fell to the personal temptation of Satan by failing to use the word. Adam fell in direct disobedience to the word, but Jesus overcame by the word. And right now, let me say that this is the only way to be an overcomer. Also, it is the only way that you can know if you are overcoming because that word can't fail. We may feel like we're overcoming our trials, but if we're overcoming our trials by our own mechanism and not by faith in the word, it will fail. The only way we can know that we're actually overcoming is by having confidence in the word of God, and then we are overcoming. But it doesn't feel like I'm overcoming, but you're overcoming because you're putting your faith in the word. Amen. I want to, let's turn it in our Bibles to Jonah chapter 2. Let's read this together. The book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 2 in verse 1. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. When Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Now, would you be nervous if you just got swallowed by a fish? Would you maybe have some anxiety and feel a little insecure? This is where Jonah's at. When Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the sea, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward the holy temple." Now look at Jonah. Jonah is looking towards the temple because in the dispensations he's in, Solomon had built a temple and in his dedication prayer, he prayed, God, anybody, anywhere in the world that's in trouble, if they turn to look at this temple because this is where you abide, if they turn their attention to what? To the word for the day, where you abide, if they turn their attention there, then you'll hear from heaven and you'll deliver them. And Jonah, listen, what, what is Jonah doing? He's not looking to a relic. He's not looking, amen, to a, 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 a building because he has no idea if he's north, south, east, or west. He has no idea where he's turning. He's in, a, in the belly of a whale. It's pitch black. He has no idea if he's up or down, if the, if the fish is swimming north or south. How can he turn to the temple? This isn't a physical turning, but in his heart, he's looking at the word for his day. He's looking at where Christ abides, and he's putting his confidence in the dwelling place of God because Solomon established this word and he believed this word and he believed what Solomon said and he stuck with the word for his day and God heard his prayer when he was in the the belly of a whale. Praise God. How do you think, well, how do you think God's not going to hear you and no matter what circumstance, what trial, what's happening, where do I turn? Turn to Christ. Who's Christ? He's the living word that's living today. This message that has been restored to us is a person that's come among us. We don't look to buildings. We're not trying to turn somewhere and pray in a direction. We're looking to the one who has arrived in the fullness of his word. His personal presence has come on the scene. Where? To dwell within us. Amen. He is here. Turn to that presence of God and say, God, I'm in trouble, but I believe that your prophet said that you're here to indwell your people, and I'm looking to you, Lord. This is where Jonah's looking. Not with his physical eyes, not turning in a physical direction, but in his heart, he's looking to the word for his day. And he says, 
And I love how, I want to go back and read this. It said, verse three, for thou hast cast me in the deep. I thought those men on those ship tied him up and threw him in. Jonah recognizes who's in control of this whole thing. Jonah has a much superior revelation. He says, thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compass me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. You know what Jonah's doing? Jonah is going to a higher revelation in his prayer. And he's just not wallowing and crying. What he's saying is, Lord, I know you had me sent here, and I know I'm in the midst of your billows and your waves. You're in control of this whole thing. That's what Jonah's saying. Thy waves, thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward the holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The, the depth closed me around about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. My goodness. You want to talk about feelings and circumstances? Those are the worst. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, unto thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. What were the lying vanities? The lying vanities was the whale's belly, the weeds wrapped around his health, uh, the, the darkness, the depths, the waves, they were all lying vanities. What made them lying vanities? Because anything that's contrary to the promise of the word is a lie. So the devil tells you you're in danger, you tell the devil, I can't be in danger, I have a heavenly father who watches over me. I have a shepherd and I'm in the palm of his hand. What do you mean I'm in danger? They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. What's he going to sacrifice? I'm going to declare thanksgiving. Where? In the midst of his trouble. I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that thou have vowed salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. I can attest to you I have never been in a circumstance that bad. I felt like I've been in bad circumstances. I have never been in a circumstance that bad. But if I ever find myself in a circumstance that bad, may I do what Jonah did and said, Lord, I, you cast me here. I'm surrounded by what you've provided. I'm here at your bidding. I'm here at your leadership. I, 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 I may have made mistakes. I may have done wrong, but you foresaw before the foundation of the world. And I'm looking to the word that you've given to us and to the promises. And I'm saying, Lord, come and deliver me. Lord, come and save me for thy glory, Lord. And thank you for keeping your word. Praise God. Thank you for keeping your word. Amen. In the message Harvest Time, he says, how different from Jesus. He stayed with the word. Now, the next few minutes, I want to prove all these things true. See, by both nature and word, bring this together. This proves he was the word made flesh for bread. He was the word made flesh for he reflected what? The word only. When he come into his temptation, he used what? Only the word. What did he reflect? The word. Amen. What's his bride to do? She's to become the word and to reflect the word. So what should she use in all of her troubles? The word. Where should her confidence be? In the word. What, what should she be declaring and praying and speaking? The word. This is what we're being trained for. And Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Brother Bram says, he proves his resurrection life then as he vindicates himself. She, the bride, is independent from all others. I love that. That's where we need to be. Amen. Independent. That we, we don't need someone else's support to serve God. He's all I need. 
I, do I want other support? Yes, I want it. Did, did God provide it? Yes, he's provided it. But I don't want to get to where I need it. If I need it, he'll provide it. If he doesn't provide it, I don't need it. So we've got to get our minds adjusted to the perfection of God, amen, and, and to God's sovereignty and say, God, I would love to have a friend, but if you don't provide a friend, you're all I need. God, I ask you for more fellowship, but if you see fit not to give it, then you're all I need. That we can ask for what we want, ask for what we need, but he knows what we need. Sometimes we need to be in fellowship, sometimes we need to be alone. Sometimes we need everybody who loves us not to call us for a week and leave us wondering why nobody likes us anymore and start feeling lonely and start feeling rejected and start feeling outcast because sometimes that's where we need to be so we start thinking so God can start speaking to our hearts. But when we get in that place, we get desperate, we start calling and reaching out and, and really what God's trying to do, and you call somebody, they don't have time for you. You call somebody else, they don't answer the phone. You call somebody else, they just left on vacation. And you wonder, what's happening to me? I'm being abandoned. You're not being abandoned. God wants to talk to you. God wants you to know, you don't need a friend, all you need is me. If I see that you need a friend, I'll give you a friend when you need a friend, but what you need more than anything is me. You need a relationship with me, you need time with me, you need confidence in me. I am all that you need, and I'm the provider of everything you need, and when you need fellowship, I'll give you fellowship. When you need a friend, I'll give you a friend. Amen, when you need deliverance, I'll give you deliverance, but put your trust in me. She is independent from all others. She's an independent woman. Praise God. I remember when I first read that, and I'm like, is she allowed to be like that? She's not independent from Christ. She's dependent on Christ. But her dependency on Christ makes her independent from dependency anywhere else. She's an independent woman, a great speckled word that's different from all others. You remember the Bible on that, the great speckled bird. She had his name. She had his life. How did they speckle the bird? They were both white and they pulled the head off of one bird and drained the blood out on the other bird. And the other bird was speckled with the red blood and it flopped its wings like this and the blood cried, holy, 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 as it made the ground. So Christ the dead mate put his blood, his blood from his life into his carrying his blood, crying, holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. It's an odd looking bird, sure it is. But she, the bride, is identified by him and she is independent from all others. He says that again. She's independent from all others. Keep thee only unto her as long as thou, as you both live, keep thee only to him, the word. No adultery, not one sign of denomination, no one sign of creed, no adultery at all, the word and him alone. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sands. And he says, that's it, Christ the word. He was the word, he is the word, and the church becomes the word by him, making her a part of him, and that's the word again. Personally identified by him, his property alone. I love that. Nobody else has rights, his property alone, amen? And so when, when the devil tries to push you around or cause sickness to come on you or, or, or cause you to have a want and need, all you have to say is, I am his property alone, I don't have to worry about it. I belong to him. I've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. I belong to Christ. I am his property alone. Amen. And he knows how to take care of his property. His property alone. She is redeemed by him. Catch this. She is redeemed by him, through him, for him, and for him alone. That's right. Then what the devil is howling about? That it's being revealed. What does God, what does the devil not want you to get this revelation of your security? Because he wants to use insecurity to move you and motivate you into leaving the word. He does not want you to come to this security where you're independent from all others and his property alone. And you've been redeemed by him alone, not by your works, but by his deeds. You've been accepted in the beloved by him, that you were chosen in him, that he paid for the price himself. And that you're the recipient of all that and you're secure in him. That's the revelation he doesn't want you to get because he wants you to still have a need and still feel insecure so that he can manipulate your insecurity to move you away from the word. But that's not why the message came in this day. The message came to give us a real security. A genuine faith by revelation in Christ so that you can become an independent woman, independent from all others 
and you can be his property and his property alone. He further down, a couple paragraphs further down, he says, identified, oh, the devil is howling about this, the manifested truth of the promise of this word in her alone. They don't have the answer. When Jesus come, why didn't those Pharisees, he said, if I cast out devils by the finger of God, who do you cast them out by? See, he stood alone. And his church stands alone. She is not hooked with nothing. Catch all this terminology. She stands alone. She's not hooked with nothing. Why? Because if you're hooked to something, you can be pulled around by that. If you're attached or tied to something, you can be moved and manipulated by whatever you're attached or tied to. And his church stands alone. She's not hooked with nothing. But he was identified by God being the body that God dwelled in. And the church is identified by his body doing the same thing. She is his body, the manifested truth of his promised word for the last days. And she, and she alone stands by it. That's why the devil is howling. These great organizations to set up something to close her up. They'll never do it. She'll be taken up, not closed up. She is now risen and by the power of the vindicated word promised to her. Amen. Why are we not afraid? Because I'm seated right now in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I've been lifted up by the message of the hour. And I have been, there's a part of me that has been lifted above all of this trouble and secure in him already. In the message harvest time, he says, I trust now that the Lord will bless his word. I'm a firm believer in the word and the word only. Just the word only. And that's the message that the Lord has given me. So what is the message the Lord gave him? The word only. What do we need? Christ and him alone. As we close, I just want to read two scriptures together. Let's go to Psalms chapter 31 and read these two places in Psalms, and then we'll finish. Psalms chapter 31. Psalms 31, this is another Psalm of David. Psalms 31, 19. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has showed me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. Oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints. For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Sometimes our hearts are failing for fear, but be of courage. Focus your eyes back on what's been given to us and let him strengthen our heart. Let's go to Psalm 27 and finish with this portion of scripture. This is the Psalm Brother Branham goes to when he preaches the rapture message. I think that's significant and I think that's powerful that when he goes to preach the rapture, this is the message that he comes to. This is the portion of scripture. So let's think about this in light of the end time, the finality, the time just before we exit this dimension. It says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Where did Brother Brenham read this? At the beginning of the rapture message. Maybe at the time of the rapture, we need this kind of revelation. Maybe we need to talk like this and act like this and believe like this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. 
One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. If you've got one request that's above all requests, make that your greatest request. That's what David said. That was the one thing he wanted above everything else is to dwell in the temple of the Lord and inquire in his temple. Verse 5, for in the time of trouble, rapture message, for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion and the secret of his tabernacle when the green berets are coming after me. (laughs) David knew what it was to be chased, to be frightened, to have his life in jeopardy, to not know what tomorrow holds. He's the one who understands this. Can we understand it when economic woes come, when crises pop up, when confusion comes around us? For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, and the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou sayest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. David said, I would have fainted unless I believed that God would come on the scene. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Who's our deliverer? He's our deliverer. When Paul and Silas were arrested, were beaten, were captives of the government, were thrown into the prison and had their feet in stocks, They did what David did. I will sing praises into the name. They began to sing praises into the Lord in thanksgiving and worship. They weren't bemoaning. They weren't groaning. They were worshiping the Lord. And one of the worst situations you can find yourself in. What did God do? He came and rattled that jail to pieces. He may not rattle your jail to pieces, but he'll give you grace to go through. And he might just rattle it down. He might just perform the supernatural and and, and move mountains. He might just move governments. He might change policies. He might bring provision from nowhere. He might have something show up on your doorstep. He might, but is it any less a miracle that he plants his grace in your heart? Is that less of a miracle than somebody leaving a sack of groceries on your door when you need it or your car starting when you lay hands on it? I don't think it's any less of a miracle when he gives his grace into your heart to give you the strength to go through what other human beings can't go through with joy and gladness and thanksgiving. I think that's just as miraculous and just as supernatural as all the other. And that we can be thankful for. When we go through dark days and tough times, but yet there's a joy in our heart, yet there's a song on our lips, and yet we have confidence in him, that didn't come from your brain. That didn't come from your emotions. That came from the Father above. And when you have that joy in your heart and a song and a realization that he will deliver you and a confidence in him, then you realize I'm in the palm of his hand. And you can sing his praises. You can call those things that are not as though they are because you know he will deliver. Man, let's all stand and musicians will come. Where is our security? In Jesus Christ alone. Just in him. When I'm wrapped in weeds around my head in the darkness and the, under the billows and under the waves in an impossible situation, then why not just cry out to the Lord? And say, Lord, I can't rescue myself. And there's not another human being who knows what should be done in this situation. The doctors don't know. My friends don't know. Nobody else knows. 
But I know before the foundation of the world, you already knew. And you know just what I need, and you can supply my every need to go through this trial, and you can move all the obstacles away. So I'm turning my eyes to you, and I'm looking to you, and I'm trusting in you. And I'm offering my sacrifice of thanksgiving to you, who is my deliverer, my sustainer, my redeemer, my healer, and the strength that carries me through. And I can praise you for all of that. Amen. The devil would love for us to be insecure. But this message came to bring us a security. It came to make us stable. It came to put us on a rock. It came to make us an independent woman, separated from all others, his and his alone. That's why this message came. And I believe all the things we're going through is bringing us closer and closer to that position. He knows what he's doing, friends. He knows exactly what he's doing. And I just want to surrender to his will. Let's bow our heads together to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Jesus, for this day you've given us. For the word, Lord, it means more to us than anything. God, when we see the, we see the troublesome times that we're in and men's hearts failing for fear, mental illness, drug abuse, entertainment, God, all of it is escapism. A desire for man to stick his head in a hole and hope that trouble passes. But God, we know by your prophet's message that trouble is not passing. It's intensifying. Lord, we recognize that this earth has to be purged by fire, atomic and volcanic, and it has to bring forth a bright new world for a millennium. But God, our confidence in you is that you'll rescue us before that time, for you've promised it. And whatever leads up to that, we're trusting in you. We're turning our eyes to you and saying, my confidence is in you. You're the strong tower that I've run to and am safe. Lord, I thank you for giving us security in your word, for we can't find it anywhere else. God, those individuals that are among us who are still perplexed and frightened, God, they need their heart strengthened. God, things happen to us, you understand, you know. You know what happened to me when I got the call of my dad dying suddenly. I couldn't help myself, Lord. The fear came in, but Lord, you helped me. There's others that are here that have an insecurity, a wound, Lord, that's still causing them problems. But God, your word has come to heal us. There's some that have been through bad church situations, had horrible experiences with ministries, were neglected and abused by parents, were abused and neglected and maybe left by spouses. God, and it leaves something inside our heart of flesh. Lord, and the devil would love to use that insecurity to control your children. But God, I'm praying that by the power of your word, ministered by your Holy Spirit. May you bring healing to every one of those situations. May you become our security. May you heal us with the balm of Gilead. May your spirit coo in our hearts like a dove and tell us that all is well. Just because we were hurt before doesn't mean we'll be hurt again. Lord, in in those hurts, you're the one who carried us through. We're here by your grace. We're here because we were in the palm of your hand when we were being neglected, when we were spoke evil about, when we were abandoned, you still had us in your hand. We're here trusting in your word and loving you because of your abundant grace in our lives, not because of our strength and not because anybody saved us, but only because you saved us. God, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for protecting us. We thank you for bringing us to this hour. And now we're putting our attention and focus on you and asking that you would strengthen our hearts, heal our wounds, and take away the devil's ability to use those hurts and insecurities to manipulate us anymore. For Father, we wanna be yours and yours alone. We wanna be independent, we wanna be your independent bride attached only to you. And we wanna be, we don't wanna be hooked to anything, no past pain. We don't wanna be hooked to a past experience. We don't want to be attached to a past relationship. 
We want to be free to be yours and yours only. God, would you free us? Would your spirit come down now and move into the hearts that have been wounded? And would you strengthen those hearts? And may they sing your praises for all that you brought them through. Not contempt and hatred for what they experienced. Not that, that, that anger and bitterness for being hurt or wounded. But may you replace that with a gratitude and a thankfulness for the sufficient grace that brought them through. May they turn to you and recognize that you were a shepherd that walked with them through the valley. That you were the shepherd that carried them when they couldn't walk on their own. And that we're all here today because you've been a faithful shepherd. We're here because you've been watchful. We're here because you've been faithful. We're here because of your love. And now may you just pull all the bitterness and poison out of these circumstances and all that brings insecurity. And may you pour your spirit in there and your love and your word. And may we be founded and rooted and grounded on your word and the revelation of predestination and your eternal will and purpose for our lives. And may it push out all the poison of bitterness and all the agony and despair. May it all go away and may it be replaced with a tremendous thanksgiving in our hearts for all that you've done for us. For you alone are worthy. You're perfect. You're worthy of our praise. God, as we move forward, may we move forward without strings attached to hurts and pain to other people, but may all those strings be cut so that we can be free to be independent and yours alone. And may you, Lord, we recognize the firm foundation that we're standing on and recognize our security in you. And may all those little fear buttons that get pushed, may they be pushed away so that we can have confidence in you alone. You are our security. You've always been our security. We've always been secure in you. We've never been in risk. You've always been watching over us. God, I say thank you for everything I've been through in my life. For your grace has always been sufficient for me. Thank you for every trial, for I've learned so much. Thank you for the heartache, because I found you to be one who heals a broken heart. Thank you for the pain, because I found one who can heal pain. I found you as a deliverer and a savior and a faithful shepherd, and I would have never known the depths of your love if I hadn't suffered deep pain. And God, I want to take my time to say thank you, Lord, for everything, for you've been with me through it all. Thank you for your deliverance. Thank you for your love. Thank you that your word has never failed, and it never shall fail. Thank you for lifting me upon a rock and lifting my head above my enemies. For I recognize now how perfectly safe I've always been and how much you truly love me. God, help your people. Help us all. May we walk out of here different today. May you lift us on a higher plane and may our confidence be in you. We love you, Father. Heal our hearts. Strengthen our hearts by your abundant grace. God, there's more work to do. There's more to manifest. There's more things that you want to display through your bride. We need your healing. We need our confidence to be centered on you. Help us, Lord. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. My Father knows what I need. My Father knows what I need. In everything I go best for me. My Father knows what I need. He's got it all in control. In control. He's got it all in control. my
Amen. I was thinking about something Brother Branham said. In his testimony one time, he was talking about the death of his wife and his daughter and how hard that was for him and he didn't understand and didn't comprehend. But he made this statement years later. He said, I didn't know then, I didn't understand then. He said, but I understand now. He had come to terms with something and he didn't, he didn't go on to explain it completely. But Brother Branham, at the end of his life, he understood that that was all necessary in the plan of God for his molding, for his shaping. And his molding and shaping was my benefit, was your benefit. His training to stay with the word, his training to, to, to not deviate off that word and not let anybody else influence him, that training that he went through was for you and I. Brother Bram comes to the end and, he, and he's not bitter about losing his wife. He's not bitter about losing his daughter. And when he tells the story, he still weeps. Of course he was hurt, but he's no longer hurt in bitterness and anger and frustration towards God. He's come to terms that, that the fact that God did what was best. And he didn't understand then, but I understand now. There's a lot of things in life that we don't understand. Why my parents abandoned me? Why somebody allowed this abuse in my life? Why no, somebody didn't stop this from happening? Why God allowed it to go on when God can stop anything? There's so many th those things we deal with in life and those questions roll around and around in our heart. But can we look to the predestinated plan of God and recognize that God has a purpose in it all that I don't understand why, but it had to be that way for something in his kingdom to work out. But Brother Jay, you don't know the pain. You don't know. I don't know your pain. The only pain I can identify with is my own. But I met a Savior who can heal pain. He allows things not because he's sadistic and not because he's lost control. He allows things because there's something that has to be manifest and there's something we have to know and understand. There's a lot of things I didn't understand then, but I understand now. I understand them now. I can say what Brother Branham said. I may not have a full picture, but there's things about my childhood I didn't understand, but I understand them now. When I was a little boy, my parents divorced when I was five years old. We were drugged from pillar to post. I went to maybe 11 or 12 different schools before junior high school. Uh, my mom, she was a manager for apartment complexes to make money. We moved from one apartment to the other. And we, like I said, drugged from pillar to post. We've had blended families and mixed families and remarriages and step siblings and dad remarried and we had, it was chaos, friends. I didn't understand then. But when I sit down in my office to talk to somebody who's had pain in their family, divorce and rejection and abuse, I now feel what they feel and I understand what they understand. And and I can give them hope and tell them there's a God that can overcome all of those things. There's a healing. Amen. I didn't understand then, but I understand now. Why I had to lose my dad when I was an 18-year-old boy. I didn't understand then, but I understand now. God was separating me to himself. And I'm not bitter about it. I'm not angry. I wasn't always that way. I was hurt and I was angry and I was upset and, and I was a rebellious teenager and I was angry about, and I didn't even know what I was angry about. I was just mad. But this message has done something to me, friends. It has put me back in his hand. This message has made, to me, in my perspective, it has made God, God, and the, the one who controls all things, and made him perfect in everything, made him perfect in every part of my life. This message to me, the revelation of this word, has put God back in the proper place in my understanding, and has brought peace back to my heart, and love, and thanksgiving. And now I'm thankful for everything in my life because if it all had to come together to make the recipe that brings me to where I am now, I can say thank you, Lord Jesus, for all of it. Because I'm so at peace in my heart with God and I know that he's in control. Friends, I didn't say that just so you know my life and feel sorry. I said that because you've been through things. You've been wounded, you've been hurt, you've been scarred. Things that shouldn't have happened. We, and from our perspective, never should have happened. Never. But listen, let God be God. 
Let him be bigger than every problem and let him be greater than every person that wounded you and let him be a God who has everything in control and knows exactly what you and I need and exactly what he's doing and let him be the God who brings healing to your heart and has grace that's sufficient for everything. Sometimes we think I can never get over that, I can never get over this. Absolutely you can get over it. Don't ever say that because he's the one that healeth all of our diseases. He's the one who came to bind up the broken hearted and set free those that are captive and bound. He absolutely can help you get over it. Don't you dare say I'll never get over that or I can't get over this, I can't get beyond that. That's not the truth. That's lying vanities. He's your security. You're secure in him. Don't let the devil use old hurts and old circumstances to keep whipping you around. And don't be hooked to the past. Let God come and cut it all off and bring a liberty that comes from having a healed heart. You know what bitterness does? It attaches you to people and attaches you to circumstances and you can never get over it. You can never get free. You wanna be free and you hate what that person did and you hate that they, that what, what they stood for and you hate what happened. But as long as there's bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart, you're still tied to it and you will drag it with you everywhere you go. The only liberty that you can have is from forgiveness that comes from God, forgiveness from the heart, healing, and let him take the bitterness out, and then you'll be free. You won't be dragging that person, that relationship, that circumstance. It won't be following you everywhere you go when you cut the ties of bitterness and unforgiveness. How can I do it? You can't do it in yourself. You can only do it by a revelation that all things work together for the good to them that love God and are the call according to his purpose. It's only the word that gives us this kind of peace. It's only the word that brings this kind of healing. Let his spirit come and administer his word in your heart. Let the spirit of God flow over you. Don't say I can't get over it. Don't say I can't forgive. Don't say I'll never be able. Don't say those things. Just open your heart and say, God, heal all the broken places in my heart. All the wounds and all the hurt. We've lost loved ones. We've lost spouses. Some have lost children. Those are deep wounds. Brother Branham had them, but he knows what it's like to be healed and allow God to use even the evil, the wicked, the bad, to use it for good. I'm tired of the devil getting leverage off everything in my life. I want God to get full benefit out of every circumstance in my life. I want his kingdom to be glorified. I want his name to be praised. I want his word to be honored. All, everything in my life, the good, the bad, the things I liked and didn't like, I want it all to come together to sing his praises for he's been good in it all. He never left me, he never forsake me, he never abandoned me, but it's his grace, his mercy, his love that's brought me to this day. And I'm thankful for it all. And I find my security in him. I hope you find the same. That God bless you is just open your heart and let him heal you. I found so many times people don't get over the past because they don't want to get over the past. They're still angry. They're still angry towards people. They're still angry towards circumstances. And they want to rehearse it and they want to throw darts because of the bitterness in their heart. I'm just telling you, stop it. Aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of talking about what this person did to me, this circumstance? Aren't you tired of talking about it? Wouldn't you love just to let it all work together for good and move forward by the grace of God and let light come out of darkness, let love come out of hatred, let peace come out of bitterness? You know what you have to do? You have to open your heart and say, God, I don't want to carry this anymore. I don't want to be bitter. I don't want to be hateful. I don't want to rehearse it anymore. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to use it to get sympathy or attention. I don't want any of it anymore. I'm tired of it all. I want it to go away. And I want you to draw all the good and benefit out of that circumstance and put it on display in your kingdom. Can you do that now as we sing? Can you just open your heart and say, God, strengthen my heart by your love and grace. And can you thank him can you thank him for the hard times? Because he proved himself faithful. 
the devil tried to steer you away, tried to ruin your life before you got started. Many times before we got started, he tried to derail us, but he couldn't stop God's plan in your life, and he couldn't stop the seed from coming forth, and he couldn't stop you from shining the light. And tell me God's not good. God is wonderfully good. Amen. Let's just sing this song together. I put my life in his hands. I put my life in his hands. So every road I walk down, I know.
Mercy, it rewrote my. 